uh, Ms. Chandra Roy Henry's consent has led since 20, 2010 the Indigenous People and Development Branch Secretariat of the U, UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at the United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs. Chandra is a lawyer by training with specialization in international law, human rights, and indigenous people. She received her Bachelor of Law from Punjab University, Pakistan, and her Master in Law from the American University, Washington, D.C., USA. Welcome. Um, welcome, welcome, Chandra. Sorry for what we're, um, uh, for, we did run a bit, a little bit over time, but, but like the, the something that Daily wanted to share was very, very interesting. I think also very important for these peoples uh, all around the world to, and not in these peoples as well, to, to understand the nuance between local, in these peoples and, lo and local communities. Um, Chandra, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. First of all, thank you all very much for inviting me to this panel. It's actually been a very interesting and inspiring discussion. And Ghazali, hats off to you for getting this together and doing this series of talks. Really, really looking forward to this. Yeah, well, when I, when I started this web series, um, there was, uh, I have to admit, there was, a short, there was a list and like on top of the list was Chanda Roy Henriksen. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people, a lot of people go to the Prima Forum and a lot of people uh, try to address the United Nations through the Prima Forum. Uh, but like they don't know, I like the 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 dynamics behind it and who is trying to. Um, I can imagine that is uh, a very challenging role for you to. Um, um, sorry, not challenging, demanding. Like it's, it demands a lot of you and your staff. So, if you can, uh, many people do not know, do not have an idea to use the print form effectively, and we're talking about effectiveness uh, in this one. What is the biggest biggest misunderstanding? Or do you have any tips um, on for these peoples on how to make very effective use of the firm forum? Well, first of all, you know, it's really good today. I was looking through the list you have of your speakers, and it's been excellent to actually see many of the old faces. Just before me was Daly, and she, as you know, was uh, the chairperson of one of the chairpersons of the forum. To say that uh, I always tell my colleagues, and I am very lucky, very privileged, that I have a fantastic team of colleagues who work with me, all of them extremely dedicated, committed. We are kind of like, um, I say that we are like the kabuki dancers, you know, in this Japanese art form, or also in Indonesia, you have the puppets, or the real people, and then behind you have the ones who have to make sure that everything goes smoothly. And we are like that, that we can only be as strong in our team, as strong as the permanent forum is. Now the permanent forum since it started in 2002 was the first session, has been increasing and gaining momentum in recognition. And it has now very much acknowledged, recognized and uh, respected as providing the global uh, forum the global space for indigenous peoples from all around the world to come, voice their concerns, their views, but also engage with the member states and the UN agencies, NGOs, academics, and others. And I believe this is one of the uh, ways that the Permanent Forum has evolved. I was involved, as were many of the others, when the Permanent Forum was first being established. And it has actually come to fruition in that way as that this is what we had envisioned, that it would be at a very high level, there would be engagement, networking, contacts, advocacy. And my first tip, I would say, suggestion to participants who come to the permanent forum is that make sure you use the space use this opportunity, use the connections, use the networking. You, I mean, this year, unfortunately, we could not have the full, have the forum session as it, as in previous years. And it was because the forum members decided in their wisdom that it would be very risky to place indigenous peoples in this kind of a situation with the pandemic raging as it was, and also taking into view the travel restrictions, people going back. So 
But for participants who come to the forum, you have the 16 members of the forum who will prepare the report with recommendations to the agencies, member states, but you also have there with you, and the forum has done this with its convening power, brought together member states, UN agencies, NGOs, academics, and others. And that's where I believe the permanent forum participants can direct their advocacy and their efforts. Talk to one of the UN agencies. Why is X, Y, and Z not being taken in my country? I'm just uh, thinking uh, earlier, I was listening to Panya in Peru. For instance, the UN system in Peru, what are they doing for indigenous peoples in COVID, if not in COVID, in governance? You know, and this is where you can use that. And we are there to help you make these appointments, these. Uh, discussions and we're happy to do so for you. Thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Chandra, because because um, yeah, because a lot of people think that it's just about sitting in a chair for uh, waiting for your three minutes and then, and then leave. But there is so much more things that you can do. And like you said, make use of the, the platform and uh, be in a room and making connections. And so thank you so much for really emphasizing that. Um, current forum was supposed to be uh, supposed to be held. Of course, COVID-19 happened. Take us through the process uh, of learning that print form was, was was postponed, and yeah, like, and because yeah, what what did you what did you think? Like, would it become a, a negative impact on any of people's advocacy? What what were your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, you know, to postpone a event of such importance and such magnitude, it's a very serious decision. And uh, we were, I'll just take you through in, I mean, chronologically in February, the permanent forum members, there's a new, new, um, new 12 members and four continuing members. They organized at the invitation of the Finnish government and the parliament of uh, the Sami parliament in Finland. They, they went for a pre-sessional meeting in Finland in Inari. And this was at the beginning of February. And already then the coronavirus had started. In fact, there was also one case in Inari, in the, I mean, in um, Finland, where we were. And as when we came back to New York, it just grew exponentially, the virus. And the first meeting that was, I mean, even larger than the permanent forum session in a way is the Commission on the Status of Women. And that was supposed to be the first week of March, and that had to be postponed, which meant that this would have repercussions for the other meetings. And we then relayed this to the permanent forum members, and we had to do it virtually like this with tele, um, telecoms and all, and said that this is the situation, what would you what do you think should happen? And we are here. We, of course, from the UN, the Secretary General himself had our offered guidance that in this kind of situation, it would be very irresponsible for the UN to convene large gatherings where you cannot guarantee the safety and security of the participants coming and leaving or being able to return to their countries and then the aftermath of what happens in the countries they return to. And for indigenous peoples, and this was very much picked up by the permanent forum members, that many of the indigenous participants who come to the forum come from very remote and often isolated communities. They come, you meet in this huge gathering of 1200 people plus, and then you go back to your communities. And as you know, with this pandemic, it's very difficult to know where it is, how it's very hidden and it's very insidious. And so the permanent forum members decided that this would not be the right situation, the right context in which to organize the annual session. And they decided that this would not take place as had been originally planned. It was with great, uh, they gave it extremely serious consideration. Of course, we offered our advice, our suggestions, and it was thus decided that they would not have the permanent forum session. Now, I just want to mention that internally, there are all these procedural uh, issues that also have to be discussed and we relate this back to the forum members because we were trying to see if it would be possible to have one later in the year 
of course, as you know, the situation has evolved to such stage. It's not, it's very difficult to foretell any of that. However, we wanted to make sure that the permanent forum session for next year was firmly in place. So the firm, forum members then prepared the agenda, the discussions, the dates, and they have actually forwarded this to the Economic and Social Council, which is their parent body. And it has been adopted and agreed by the Economic and Social Council. So the next session is firmly in place for um, April 19 to 30, 2021. Hopefully it will be able to take place. But as you know, it's still very much uncertain in terms of the circumstances as and when there will be a virus or the situation will be resolved to the, for the safety and security of all. Oh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Chandra, for, for laying that all out so that people understand like that it's not an easy decision that, that the, the, the Secretariat mm -hmm. and, and the members had to make, but it was a well, um, yeah, well thought over decision, not an easy decision, definitely not. Um, zooming in a little bit on like on, on the UN and like Indian peoples, uh, what are you sensing then um, that's going to happen within the United Nations that will potentially impact or might have an impact on Indigenous governance or maybe diplomacy? Any, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, the UN is also looking at how the UN has been for the last 75 years. And now the first thing you have to remember, <clears throat> and this was brought up by some of the earlier participants, that a lot of the decisions are actually taken by member states. However, indigenous peoples play a very, very important role in terms of advocacy, lobbying, advocating for their rights, voicing their concerns. And now, of course, we have the 2030 development agenda. And the basic principle of that is to leave no one behind. However, from the uh, anecdotal and evidence-based analysis that, has, that is coming up, it says that yes, indigenous peoples will be among those who are most likely to be left behind. So in this kind of scenario, there are entry points. You have the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, 2007, and it was prepared, adopted at I believe it was the indigenous peoples who made it happen. Indigenous peoples also made it happen. There was a world conference on indigenous peoples in 2014. Ghazali, you were very much involved in that. And uh, as a result of the 2014 world conference, there is a system-wide action plan on the rights of indigenous peoples. Now linked to that, there is also a current process which is going on about changing the way the UN works and making it more relevant and more actual. We have to remember that this was 75 years ago and now you have, it's a different environment we work in. So the UN is also trying to respond to this. The UN is doing its best to be agile and flexible. It's a huge, huge bureaucracy. It is uh, decisions are taken by member states. So it sometimes takes a while to get things moving. We got the declaration after 20 years, the World Conference in 2014, and now you have the system-wide action plan. You have the 2030 development agenda, which makes specific references to indigenous peoples. Only happened because indigenous peoples with the support of member states made it into the actual, uh, outcome documents. Now you have these opportunities and with the development reform process that is ongoing and from our team, and that's one of the effects of that is our team has actually been increased. We are now the indigenous peoples and development branch. Earlier we were only for the secretariat as of the permanent forum. And the reason for that is because we are actually being called upon to do more, not just for the forum, but additional to, we always did that earlier. But now with the system of action plan, the 2030 agenda has become much more prominent and much more um, in demand. So because of that, using these entry points, the development system also has to change, take more uh, cognizance, be more take more recognition and actually action for indigenous peoples, wherever they may be. And with the 2030 agenda, one of the advantages compared to the MDGs when indigenous peoples were invisible is that with the 2030 agenda, it is only 
it is not just for developing countries, it is universal in application. And thus indigenous peoples, wherever they may be, whether they're in Norway, Sweden, Finland, Alaska, or US or Canada, Australia, or in uh, Peru or um, Kenya or wherever, this is all related and that they should be able to be more responsive to this. Forgot to put me on, on unmute. Um, th thank you, uh, Chandra. Um, quickly, like what, what we're seeing now is COVID exposes uh, like also the, the hyper transparency of the, of the world around us, uh, except for diplomacy, uh, which is still very closed, rel rel relatively closed. Um, do you see any, anywhere, like uh, where do you see the need for transparency and, and where not? Uh, you know, COVID has taken everybody unaware. Nobody was prepared prepared for a pandemic of this scale. And you actually, it shows us how interrelated everything is and everyone is that, you know, there's one sneeze in uh, some remote area in one of the isolated communities. And then this goes off all the way to, let's say the major cities of New York and, uh, and Paris. We, for instance, uh, I'm based in New York, the UN is here. And this has been the hardest hit when it first struck. Now, the, in terms of indigenous peoples, and we have just to mention that we have opened up a web uh, page on our uh, UN DESA site for indigenous peoples to send in their questions and their experiences and their uh, advocacy and messages. And we're putting that up there. For indigenous peoples, they are very often uh, not included in the COVID responses, or if they are included, it is not to the extent that they need to be. And we are hearing alarming reports of medical facilities not being available in indigenous communities. Now, already indigenous peoples face major challenges in accessing uh, medical facilities. Now with COVID, this has made it even worse. And in some countries, it is to such extent that you have indigenous peoples trying to do what they can themselves in their communities, but it is not enough. And of course, for that, we have actually been talking to the UN system. And we have prepared from our team and there's an interagency support group on indigenous uh, peoples uh, from the, all the UN agencies. And they are the ones who have prepared guidance for the UN country teams to say that when you work on COVID responses, you must make special efforts. Otherwise you do not include indigenous peoples. And in this, the very important is indigenous women who are among those who are the hardest hit and indigenous youth and children. And in just a quick uh, comment, a, comment that for indigenous children now with the COVID and distance learning, they have not been able to access that because they don't have commuter, computers. And if they do have computers, Wi-Fi is not available in their villages. So it is kind of like a double jeopardy in a way that first, wherever they are school, they don't have the facilities for distance learning. And these are all issues that are very, very urgent, very real in terms of also food security and the reports of hunger in many of the indigenous communities. Thank you so much, Chandra. Um, any, any final thoughts, um, so something that we didn't talk about that you, that you really want to um, address or uh, want pe indigenous people to think about? Two things. One is to do a little bit of propaganda because, you know, with COVID, sure. 9th August is the International Indigenous Peoples Day. And the theme for this year's uh, commemorative event, which will be held on the 10th of August in the morning, virtually, will be on the pandemic and Indigenous peoples. And we want to show how Indigenous peoples are not really wait, sitting and waiting for things to come to them because in many cases they are not coming. They are taking matters in their own hand, but what has been the response of the member states? What has been the response of the UN system in, in helping with that? That's one thing. The other one I wanted to just say is that for indigenous peoples, and I think Azali, you mentioned it, that coming to the UN, making a speech 
has an impact, but that is not the impact only of your presence at UN meetings. And it's not just at the UN here in New York, it's when you go to Geneva, when you go to Rome, when you go to Nairobi or to wherever the UN has a presence. Make sure that you go and talk to the UN people, UN colleagues who are there. They have to listen to you, make an appointment, talk to them, lay your concerns out, but also in the same time, when you have the opportunity, engage with member states, talk to them, explain to them. And in the discussions this morning, I was listening a lot and how clearly the message was getting across that indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. They also want to have the right to determine their own priorities and take part in the episode and take part in the discussions and the decisions as to what is their development priorities and how they can be involved and participate to make sure that the UN Declaration is a reality. We, fought, we were 20 years struggling for that, we have it now. Make sure it is used and implemented and helps Indigenous peoples all over the world. Thank you so much, Chandra, uh, for your time. I know you're very busy. Um, um, it's very early right now in New York. Um, be it's safe. Not early, um, 10 30. Uh, uh, you're working from home now, or are you? Yeah, we're okay. all working from um, home. They're trying to see how they can, how and when they can go back. But Ghazali, always here for you all. And thank you very much for having me. And anytime, just we you know we're all here, not just me, also my team, my colleagues, fantastic colleagues, all here for you. Thank you.